All right, welcome everyone. I'm Mark Hummel and welcome to Mark Hummel's Harmonica Party. I'm here with my uh, collaborator since 2012, the great Anson Funderburg from Dallas, Texas. And we're just going to talk about blues and guitar and Anson's career and just all the different things he's done over the years and maybe Golden State we can talk about and how that launched. And um, the first thing I wanted to get get with you about is I heard you guys talking in the van yesterday. Oh, and by the way, we're in Nelson, B.C., uh, uh, where it's still cold, even though it is the middle of May. But um, we're in a motel room and... Uh, we decided we'd do this thing on the road since that's the way it works out. Seems like that's where we we're back on the we're road. We're back again. on the road as we normally have been up until two years ago. So um, I wanted to just talk to you a little bit about you and uh, Rusty were talking in the van about uh, uh, the first, like when you first saw B.B. King and you had. Uh, you bought yourself, was that your first guitar, the one that you bought that was a, what was it, 345? Well, no, I actually had a, a my first guitar that my, my parents bought for me. It was just a little old round hole acoustic guitar. Right. And I've, you know, I, I've probably told this story a, a bunch of times. People may know it or not. But when I bought that guitar, the lady that my mother bought it from, uh, it came with a box of 45s. Oh, okay. And in that 45s, it had Hideaway by Freddie King, had uh, Honky Tonk by Bill Doggett, a uh, bunch of Jimmy Reed stuff, some wow. Ray Sharp, you know, Linda Lou. So it had a, had a bunch of, of uh, shuffles, you know. <laughs> so it's kind of like <laughs> the so, guitar and shuffles. What were you going to yeah, do after that? After that, you know. <laughs> but uh, it, had, it also had snow combs in it with Albert Collins and right. I heard that and I went holy cow this is uh, <laughs> this is what I want to learn <laughs> wished I know how to do this yeah so then off we go well that's uh, that's uh, pretty pretty serendipitous like this is what I'm supposed to do <laughs> kind of right yeah I think what you overheard was me ruining a 330 right 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 <laughs> and then you saw B.B. King and you and you bought a you bought well, a, thing, I was a huge, Yeah, I mean, I was a huge fan. I had a 330. The 330 had P90 pickups in it. And, you know, B.B. King had a 335, so I wanted mine to look just like his. <laughs> Not realizing it wasn't the same guitar. No, no. One has a, a block of wood underneath the pickups, and the other one's hollow. And, aye, uh, aye, aye. And I... Uh, I drilled out the, the holes, or I had the holes drilled out, with the person telling me, you know, this may not work, because, uh, <laughs> you know, but I had to have that. Uh, and that, sure enough. And sure enough, it did not work. <laughs> All it would do was howl from then on. Oh, my God. <laughs> so how old were you when, when you had that guitar? You know, I was probably 17, somewhere in there. And your first guitar, you were how old? Uh, oh, I was really young. I was in my grade school. What, the, when you got all the 45s? Yeah. Wow. You know, and why, and why, why the nightcap were a big, uh, right. a big deal. Not nightcaps. Nightcaps, I right. Pronounce that, uh, <laughs> Not little good. Charlie Not and the Charlie, nightcaps. Not Charlie, but, but it was the nightcaps. And, right. And they were a huge, they were a big regional band that did. They were kind of like a had a teen audience. Oh right? yeah, 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 yeah. And it was it was a it was a cool cool band. They did wine wine wine. Right, and, I have that. Yeah. And Thunderbird. Right, right. A lot of wine songs. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, bad influences. Uh, bad influence. I tried all of them. I think. <laughs> or another. By high school, you were, you were, sounds like you were pretty solid in the blues. Now, you told me you met B.B. King. I did. Like, really him. early. I met B.B. King when I was in one of my first bands. The, um, uh, the rhythm guitar player's mom was the manager of the band, and she went with us everywhere, and she was sort of like a, a, a guardian for me because I couldn't, right. I couldn't be in nightclubs at that age, so I had to have, some sort of a 
you know, legal, legal guardian. Yeah, yeah, legal guardian. But yeah, she took us to um, a place that was called the Losers Club. I'll never forget it. It was uh, it was a, a, an amazing uh, moment for me to see him yeah. play. And it, you know, at the end of the night, somehow I don't know, maybe probably Alice, the the manager, you know, said I was a big fan and BB as it was a small place right. it wasn't really very big so right. he set me on the stage with him while he greeted like he always oh, did wow. you know wow. people coming yeah. and going yeah. and, that's how I met him too and uh, he seated me beside him and as he was shaking hands and and telling people bye and you know listening to people talk and stuff he he uh, he kind of talked to me for you know this and that so you want to be a guitar player oh, right. really, you know yeah and all that kind of stuff but it was uh gave me a pick it was a red pick and BB. i don't know whatever happened to it it was uh a moment it was yeah. a moment you yeah. Know? yeah i was 15 i think I, wow uh, you know uh that was probably 69 mm -hmm. 1969 i want to say i mean i'm not trying to blow smoke here but i mean in a sense he kind of seems like he almost sent set uh, set the template for kind of both your guitar playing and also just your personality in terms of interacting with people. Probably, uh, you know, especially uh, over the years of watching him and and realizing how much of an ambassador right. he was for not only his music but all just blues in general. Well, yeah. Blues in general. Yeah, yeah. He was the uh, last guy standing. You know, yeah. he shook hands and talked to until no one's left. To talk and I've to. seen you do the same thing. Well, I love people. Yeah, you're yeah. kind of the ambassador of Beale Street and well, King Biscuit. And, you know, I mean, down, when you're down there, it looks like you're running for political office. <laughs> well, it's a sight to see. Yeah, boy, that would be a job I wouldn't want. No, it's a sight to see, though, man. You kind of... You know, you but have, you know, those you have people, that part. Just like you, I mean, I've I've played long enough. I guess I, you know we've both gotten older, and you know, you just think about all the people that you've met mm -hmm. over the years. I mean, yeah. you and I have a lot of a lot of a lot of friends and, right. and fans, right? You know, and fans that are friends. And so, the best part is that you know how to kind of like make them think that you haven't forgotten them. Well, you and know that's a that's a real gift too. You yeah. know, there was once upon a time when, when I I did remember better, and uh, <laughs> uh, it might have been a few fans, a few friends <laughs> ago, but but I, I you know I still know faces and know people right. sometimes anymore. You know, sorry if you if I don't remember your right. name sometimes, but I. You know, I've I've kind of got to the point where I, I I'm not a hundred percent anymore. Right. Well, you I know. think all of us are. You know, it's just a, at the age we're at and the the number of miles we've done. And well, it's very important to for me to uh, you know to to show my appreciation of people coming to see me for sure. For I, I mean, forty for, fifty years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's I, a long I started, time. Yeah, I mean, I, I started playing in nightclubs when I was 15 years old. Yeah, it's amazing. And, and then here we are, 15, 16 years old. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm 68. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing that we've been able to do what we love for this long. I never thought I'd ever do, no. be able to stay in this business. Uh -uh. I know, no. you know, I always, I'm still looking when I'm going to have to get a real job. <laughs> It may happen yet. No, I hear you, man. Oh my God! Well, you're lucky because you, 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 both you and you and West Star, you know who you've worked with forever. Both you guys have this ability to, like, you know, if times are slow, you can pick up and you can do these different things that you know how to do besides music, and that's a, that's a real lucky thing. I don't have. I, I'm just useless if I'm not, that's, you know, booking or or playing on stage. Yeah. And I have good friends that help me. Right. After you got out of high school, when was the Bees Knees Band? So somewhere at the towards the end of seventy five, the beginning of seventy six, till uh, seventy eight. 
Mm -hmm. I believe. Because I started the Rockets. And that was a successful band. It was. Well. I mean, you guys were on a real label and, and all that, right? Well, we had we had two records out. Uh, it was on Derek Records. And we had lots and lots of interest in major labels. Right. I mean, you know, the, I'm sure everybody that's an artist has, you know, had those, you know, moments where they went, where they almost Almost made almost it, made yeah, it yeah, over yeah, the yeah. hill, but yeah. didn't. <laughs> right, that's and, true. That's and that band was story. sort of one of them, you know. And uh, different kind of music. Um, they called it tropical rock. Hmm. And there were three singers, and they were really the bee's knees. Mm -hmm. And the rest of us were just in the band. Right. Uh, uh, but uh, very successful around the Dallas-Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. And really was a uh, uh, a stepping stone for me as far as being able to get press around Dallas and right. people know who I was. Right. So so how did you meet uh, the original Rockets? You guys ended up on Blacktop, what, I guess two years after you started? That's, I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, but how did you meet, like, say, Daryl Nullish and... and uh, well, Freddie Farrell and, and those guys. Well, I knew Freddie from living in Austin because he played right. in a band called Storm. Oh, he was in that band. He with, was in Storm. With Jimmy Vaughn, yeah. Wow. And as um, far as Daryl, I, I was at, Daryl and I got introduced from, by a guy named Charlie Wurz, who owned Charlie's Guitar Shop oh, yeah. in Dallas, which is, it was a famous guitar yeah. shop, or at least that's my remember it so right <laughs> now how did Hammond end up end up signing you guys uh well we we started the Rockets right and it was Mark Hickman David Watson and Daryl and myself okay and we were playing in New Orleans at a place called Clarities and Hammond happened to be in there liked us and uh and you guys were the very first band on Black Top Records yep yeah. Uh, yeah. Talk to You by Hand right. was uh, BT-1001. That wow. was the very first uh, uh, blacktop recording. Yeah. And I also met Doug Reinach, the, P or the old piano player yeah. for the Rockets. Yeah. He was opening up for us really? playing solo piano. Wow, Clarities. too much. And that's now, was he living in New Orleans? He was living in New Orleans. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know Doug from uh, well, him played playing in my band for yeah. about a year and a half. Yeah. Yeah. That pretty much puts you guys out into the, the scene. I mean, it seemed like him and Scott did a really good job of getting Blacktop out there and all over the country. Pretty pretty quick. Yeah. I mean, I guess the For first, a first record, you know. I mean, we did two records for him fairly quickly. We did mm -hmm. She Knocks Me Out and, and then the first one, Talk to You by Hand. And, yeah. their label. and he started a real label in the sense of that he was... Signing people like right from the get go, he signed Ronnie Earl, yeah. as I recall, yep. early on. Yeah. Um, who are some Mike other ones? Morgan and Mike Crawl. Morgan and the Crawl, and then later on, and you got him that right, didn't you? Get him, Mike? Mike, yes, yeah, you I got him to sign, yep. yeah. And I also introduced him to Big Joe and the Dinoflows. Oh, okay. Right. But, you know, Earl King. Yeah, I mean, he ended up King. getting all he kinds of all great kinds people. Of wonderful yeah. people. And, yeah, Snooks uh, Eaglin. Yeah. Thunderbird Davis. Made some wonderful records. Yeah, yeah, great. And records. really helped everyone. Yeah. You know. On the scene. I think he was really uh, very influential kind of in that Southwest or the, 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 the Southern scene and, you know, up in the, in the Northeast. And that seemed to be. You know, between Texas and the Northeast, it seemed like that was kind of his. his That's true, but you know, he also area. he also signed Rusty. Right, but Rusty uh, was pretty late. Late, yeah. late in the game. But yeah. Rod, they. That's they true. He had Rod in there late in the game James too. Arnold. True. Good point. So yeah. he, uh, you know, they yeah. were really sort of. They were a fairly pretty solid. They were. Uh, record label, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, and uh, Mindy Giles started in there, I think, and then moved to Alligator, did. right? I don't. I can't I, remember if it was backwards. I like, think that's backwards. Yeah, I think yeah. she was with Alligator first. First, uh, yeah. Uh, but that you know, it was it, what a wonderful time. 
having a band and playing music. And well, and yeah, and I mean, you guys had all those great shows in New Orleans, like the Bluesorama, the Blacktop yeah. Bluesorama, and yeah. these package shows where you guys would back up, you know, all these great people, and and you know, you guys were obviously doing that on record too. We did, you know, you know more um, more in the beginning than at the end. We were busy and. Yeah. You know, uh, as time went on, of course, Hammond was able to find other people in New Orleans where he wasn't bringing people down. Right. Uh, but, you know, he used enough of a, of a core of people, like he'd fly me in, but maybe not with the band. Or, right. And he always used calves a lot. For right. Doing a a right. lot of the horn arrangements and stuff. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, Black A lot Top, of key players in there. A lot of key yeah. players. And Black Top, I think, sort of developed some sort of a vibe and a, of, and a sound of, of its own. I think. Mm -hmm. Sort of like chess, you know. Right. It was right. Uh, it, it was a lot of fun. It was nice yeah. to be a part well, of it. You guys that. had some great shows, man. I saw a lot of great shows down in, at Tipitina's, you know, on the Black Top uh, those different block top shows. A lot of people I got introduced to, like Bobby Radcliffe and, sure. and Robert Ward. He's another one, you know. Um, I mean, Snooks I already knew about, but I mean, those shows with Snooks and Earl King were just stellar. Oh, great. Incredible shows. And yeah. the records that they made were... And you got to make a record with Snooks, right? I did. Snooks it, yeah. it was, uh, I think we did half of it, and then Ronnie Earl's band right. did half of it, and the name of the record was called out of nowhere. Right. Well, you know, Hammond and Nauman, uh, they deserve so much credit in putting all these things together and making a lot of this stuff happen. Mm -hmm. You know, I think um, just from finding artists uh, or, you know, even as time went on, they, they kind of, like I said before, they kind of found musicians and they'd, they'd add other people like Ronnie played on a lot of records. I played on a lot of records. Kaz was on. Ron Levy. Ron Levy was on a lot of yeah. records. Yeah. I mean, you know, wrote songs for him. Did mm -hmm. you know, for different artists that that maybe didn't have songs. And I mean, it was, it, it was a it, it was a it was a fun time and it was a, it, it was a great time and I you know. I would think exciting. It was very yeah, exciting. Yeah, yeah. I spent a lot of time in New Orleans. Yeah. Uh, at that particular time, knew a lot of people there, and and um, it was great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know what else to say about. Yeah. That, you know? Well, the, the 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 one thing I really want to get into because I met you. I want to say I met you. I think in nineteen eighty six or seven, and you. I think you had just started with Sam. I did. Okay. 86 was Because the year. I remember walking down the street in Dallas, me and you, and we ran into Mike and Daryl, I think, on the street. Mike Morgan. Mike Morgan. Yeah, and Daryl Nolish. Because Mike actually, uh, right. Darryl actually played with Mike. That's what I'm Mike. saying. Yeah. And I think we, we were walking down the street and we ran into those guys, and then you kind of told me, like, you know, you were working with Sam and, and stuff like that. And, and right after that, when I left town, the next day or a couple days later, you told me to look up Fingers Taylor. And so you were my introdu introduction to Fingers, who became a really good friend of mine. And the, in Jackson. Know, Fingers, he was an unbelievable collector of records. Sure was. And I, I'm sure you know mm -hmm. that. And you probably spent a many hour with him. I basically, I basically got pretty much two thirds of my collection as his stuff. I'm telling you. Yeah. I'm and a big portion of my repertoire is from his records. He was a, he was a crazy cat, man. And I, I loved him to death. And, yep. uh, we first started, well, I met Sam in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, I would have probably never met Sam if I hadn't have made this talk to you by hand record because we were out touring, supporting that. And in those days, we played at a lot of stores. Right. Well, there was a store called Bebop Records, and um, we were doing an in-store, and a guy by the name of Pete Cushney, I found out later, came in and said, 
hey man, I sure do dig the way y'all did uh, My Love Is Here To Stay. Oh, okay. And I said, yeah, it's a great song, man. And he goes, you know, I play with, with Sam Myers. And I said, you play with Sam Myers? I didn't know he was still alive. <laughs> and he goes, oh man, yeah, Sam, Sam plays all over Jackson, you right. know? Uh, he goes, I'll, I'll bring him in tonight or this she said I don't think he's playing this weekend you know but uh, and if he's off uh, you know uh, we'll we'll come in and see you and they did and we just instantly became friends right when you made my love is here to stay on blacktop with Sam which was your first album together were you guys officially playing together was that prior to no that was prior to okay uh, it was just you know uh Daryl was still in the band. Doug was still in the band. Freddie was in the band at that particular time, and I think Jack Newhouse was was the bass player who went on to play with Stevie Ray. Right. Now, how did Wes end up as the drummer on that? Because I loved the way Wes played, and I always right. did. Right. And you know, you guys had you, done a Fingers record. We had right? done a Fingers yeah. record. Well, after I met Sam, playing over at George Street. I kind of got in in, uh, in Hammond's ear and I said, you know, we should make a record, put together a really good band and make a record with Sam Myers. Yeah. And that's all That's all that was. It was just wow. like a... A project. It was yeah. just a project to yeah. do. And then once we did it, the record turned out so good that I said, well, gosh, you know, maybe we can sell this as a little bit of a package show right. and, and just add Sam to the show. So is that kind of what you did? And that's what I did. Oh, oh okay. And, Interesting. Uh, I don't think we ever really planned on or in my back of my mind thought, well, Sam was going to be in the Rockets for 20 years, which he was. <laughs> you know, I was just trying to, you know, Here's a guy that right. It that, made sense to try yeah, it. Yeah, I, yeah. Here's a guy that made records yeah. in the fifties and was right. phenomenal. Yeah, sure was. And it's you know at this particular time you know when I think back on it I'm going Jesus he was so young. You know, <laughs> but at the time at you're the like, time I was going yeah well, he was this old man he's an old man you know but I mean he was yeah. when I, we he's made forty eight he was forty eight years incredible. old that's incredible yeah and. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so... Now, did you produce that, by the way? Well... Or was it kind of both of you? I, I, Hammond had a good sense of picking good songs. Right. Like, obscure things. Mm -hmm. And he had... He was unbelievable on finding those things. And he was wonderful of formatting once you've got a body of songs recorded. Right. How to, how to put them in how order. How to place yeah. them in an order that made it work. Now, how about the actual production? Would you say you learned some production from Hammond? Because you, you've turned into such a great producer as far as you know, I, I, you know. And I'm not just blowing smoke well, because no, but I mean my you do have a real knack for, for getting a good sound on a record. And, and that's sort of, that's an art to be able to do that. Well, having, having, having people be able to hear which is a good headset mix mm -hmm. and letting people be themselves and creating a good, productive, positive vibe in the studio. Right. Is sort of all I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, it's, what it's a little more difficult. It's than really, that, it's but. really interesting to watch you produce. Cause I mean, I've, ha I've worked with a few different people, you know, the musicians in particular that helped me produce records and what I really love about the way you do it is you have a knack for being able to just kind of sit back, listen to the record and go, maybe this would work. A little more bass right there. Or maybe this would work. A little less piano. Or, I mean, and you say it in a very relaxed kind of way that doesn't tend to rattle engineers or musicians. And at the same time, it's got this huge effect on the outcome of the sound of the record. I think you're right. Yeah, I and it was it was really interesting to watch because you're one of the most laid back guys I've ever seen produce a record, and at the same time you got the best results of anybody I've ever seen. I just try to help people get the best that they can do, and that's mm -hmm. really kind of your job in my in my book. For 
But you got a great ear for it. That's what I'm getting at. I don't know. But no, I mean, I'm, uh, that's my that's my take well, on it. I mean, I did two records with you, and the first record was not produced by you, and the second was. And the, the difference to me between production of the first and second was pretty stark. It's it's I like making records, and I like I like putting people together, which you already put the people together, but I like to help people achieve some sort of a of a uh, what's the word? Uh, some way to be comfortable in the studio because it's it's a place to where you're totally under a microscope, and if you feel like you're under a microscope, you'll never take a chance, and you'll never you'll never achieve what you want to achieve unless right. it, you're. Un to me, playing music is a group of people reacting. To each other, off of playing. each other, yeah, yeah, good. Point. And if you can make that happen, and you can keep people in on the road and out of the ditch, right? Most of the time, the result is pretty good. Yeah, good point. And most of the time, my first attempt at something, or first second, first or second attempt at something, is the but unless I totally don't know it, right. it's usually the best because right. it's my first thoughts on it, and I'm reacting to something else. Once I start trying to perfect what I did the, the first time is when it loses something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, and, and that's getting back to the, San, you know, the first Ants and Sam record. That's where I really got, I really had a strong uh, uh, response to that record because the record was so, it felt like such a natural combination of you and Sam, the way Wes plays on it, Wes just blew my mind when I heard that record. Those drums you know. were amazing. And we used a lexicon uh, reverb hmm. thing that I'd never seen before until that particular time. And the engineer at that particular time uh, at January Sound was Larry Wallace. And I'm not sure exactly what he did on, on those records, but I know it was some sort of special reverb type Interesting. thing. And I'm telling you, those drums sound so, yeah. they're just so present. Yeah, I was going to say between really all the instruments on it, especially in particular the guitar, the harp, and the drums just have this magnificent tone. It was coming out of them. I mean, you know, all three of you guys, actually everybody, but I'm just saying your guys uh, sound together and the, and the way, like you say, Hammond picked the songs, the way Sam is playing and singing on it, the way you're backing Sam, the way Wes is playing, responding to everything. It's really, I mean, that was an album that literally, I remember I would put it on right before a gig to it, get inspired for the gig. It was, uh, it it's my, it's probably my favorite record yeah. that that I've ever yeah that the I've, that I ever did. It's not really a Rockets record, but right. It's sort but it's of a kind great of record. It it was really a, a a moment. Yeah, yeah, good. I'm yeah. glad you feel that way. I do. I, yeah, I do. totally. Yeah. yeah, and uh, you know, 20 years with Sam. I mean, you know, I I remember uh, when I had you guys come out in 2002, I think it was, when you played with Snooky and, uh, and uh, Snooky Pryor and, and uh, God, we had a whole host of people. I think uh, Annie Rains and Paul Rochelle and Carlos Del Junco, they were all on the show, but it was just me and you and Sam and uh, Snooky in the van. And I remember just having such a great time with you guys. And fun. and watching you with Sam was really an eye opening experience because, uh, to me, you really looked after him in a way that very few other humans look after each other. You know, you really uh, took took the time to really make sure he was comfortable and taken care of, and and it, it, you know, it was a very special thing to watch. I loved it. Yeah, you did. You did. It was obvious. You know, and obviously he loved you too because I mean you know, you don't stay with somebody for twenty years if they're that's not there. 
Well, but I'm going to be walking on soft as sand soon. <laughs> he was yeah, such a character. He, he was a way he was a yeah, character. He was really a character. Very <laughs> funny. Yeah, he was. Yeah. You know, he was always, on that trip, the one thing I remember about it is he he loved the Snooky. way Snooky yeah. sang. Yeah, he sure uh, did. That old man has some pipes. Yeah. <laughs> And he didn't give that kind of stuff up he, easy. No, he never no. really gave a whole lot of compliments to anybody. No, he no. sure didn't. <laughs> but I loved hearing him do his awful Charlie Musselwhite impersonation. <laughs> <laughs> One he, of the no, worst he probably didn't ever. even start that until he until started. I started <laughs> until I started. But he was, you know, Brother Mog, maybe you could do Charlie again for me. <laughs> <laughs> And then he'd do an e a really awful version. I know you kind of gave up uh, playing after he died for a little bit, right? Well, you just kind of took some time off. I just took a minute off. I'd been on the road for a long time. Uh, my son had been was born in in two thousand six, and um, you know, I I just didn't I just didn't work for a moment. Right. But it it really wasn't very long. Now that I look at it, <laughs> yeah, was it something you felt like you needed to do? You know, I just, I just, it just happened. Yeah. You know, I, it's probably by now you know that about me that I, you know, I'm, I sort of take my time and just kind of wait for whatever is going to come to come right. and right. show up. Seem like things just sort of show up for me. Mm -hmm. I think that's true in life. Yeah, I mean, you know, if, if you can do that, if you can have the patience to kind of wait and see what comes along. Most of the things that I've tried to force don't work out so right. good. Exactly. So, you know, over the years, I've just kind of gave it a moment and, uh, you know, it opened up a whole lot of doors for me, you know, like producing records and, and fooling with, with music and playing with, with different people that I, you know, for all those years from about from 1978 till till 2007 or 6 right. 7 I guess he passed yeah. away in 2007 uh I had played with my thing yeah always you know, your own thing. always my own thing it yeah. was just like when you when you had us in 2002 I was That was like, a rarity yeah, it's like man, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I'm that was a rare. We talked about it, and I was going, "Well, you know, I'm so used to to doing this, you know." Right. And um, but we did it, and and it that was cool. Fine. Yeah, it worked out. Fine. Yeah, it worked out great. Yeah, I mean, I had Bob, I think, back then with me. Bob he, Welsh. Yeah, yeah. Marty on drums, and I can't remember who played bass. I think it was Steve Wolf on bass. Might have been. Yeah, Steve Wolf on bass. Charles Wheel on guitar. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, I mean it all it all felt like it came together pretty well. Um yeah, I mean because I remember I had tried to get you a few other times and you were always kind of like, well, I work with my own band. I really yeah. don't work with other people's bands and But you know, since then, I mean since really I guess since after after we started doing the Golden State. Right. Uh you know, I mean I've kind of worked with You've worked with a lot, a lot of people. A lot of different yeah, people, you, really have, you know. Yeah. You know, I used Eric to, Lindell Eric, and, and uh, um, of course we went out with, you know, after I made that record in 1990 with Delbert, we were booked by the same person and I, I did play on some shows with him because we opened up for him a lot on, right. on bigger shows and then I would get up and play, you know, some of the new stuff that I was on that I recorded with him. And, and how long have you been doing the cruises like with him, with Delbert? You know, a long time. Well, I mean, we did the very first one. Oh, okay. We were on the first one, and then the Rockets were were on uh, the first. I don't know, five or or six of them, maybe. Right. I think, and then uh, then we stopped doing them, uh, and then after that, I started going by myself and just kind of floating around and playing with different right. people. Right. Delbert and I played on the first uh, ultimate. It was called the Ultimate Rhythm oh, and Blues. Okay. That was Roger Neighbors' deal. Yeah, and right. we did the first two of those, I think. Uh, 
And then Delbert decided he that he wanted to do one. He goes, I think I can do this. I could do the same thing. Yeah, and uh, and he did. You know, he but he, you know, it was more of a singer, not singer songwriter, but it it had different kinds of music on it. It right. was uh, not strictly blues. It wasn't just strictly yeah. a, a a blues cruise, mm-hmm. so to speak, and. Um, you know, I think they, I mean, they... That's probably widened your audience, I would think. You know, I think me doing that record with with Delbert absolutely yeah. widened my audience. Yeah. And and doing some, you know, I, we actually, over the years, have had some interesting things happen to us, you know, like we, we were in that, that China Moon movie. Right. You know, there was another movie that was called The Ninth Life that Sam and I got to be in, and Mike Judge was playing bass on it right, before he right. was uh, had the success that he's had, right. too. What, Mike was in the band on both of them, or one of them? Uh, Mike no, Judge. Mike was, on, Mike was playing in the band on The Ninth Life, and I don't think it ever it, it made, came it, out. It, really. it may not have made it. Just a lot of opportunities opened up over that t- over that time. I, you know, we played the grand opening uh, for Boz's play right, for Slims, Slims, right? And it right. was it was Katie Webster, and, right? And then it was us, and then Delver. Wow! And 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 Boz guest starred with us wow. as Presidio Slim. Right, 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 right. And, you know, yeah. and we played a lot at Slim's, and then... And you guys were on TV together. Yeah, and then Boz yeah. called me out of the blue and right. asked me if I'd go and play that uh, that David Sanborn thing. Right. Uh, what was that called? Night Music, I right. think, or something. Right, The 90s were pretty good. A good time for yeah, you, yeah. yeah. A pretty good time. And I was going to say, Mike, uh, Mike Judge, who most people know from Beavis and Butthead, when... Uh, he played with me for about a year, year and a half, and then I, I remember got his you, number. Right, you got his yeah. number from me, and he had just moved. I guess did he move to Albuquerque? Was that what happened? He or, was in Albuquerque. I right, think you're right. And he had yeah. moved back from California. He'd been playing with me when he lived in in the South Bay, and then when he left my band, he moved back to Albuquerque, and I think that's when I gave you his number. And then he ended up playing with you for quite some time. What was that about? It? Five years or something? No, I don't think he was with us quite that long because he and Cheska started having children. Right. Once he started having children, he knew he didn't want to be on the road. On the road, right. I think. And, yeah, I can understand. And that. and he uh, he when he left the band, he went back to school for a moment. Oh, okay. And, and I know he was playing with Doyle Bramhall Sr. He did? Yeah. Uh, Doyle was sort of just not... But it wasn't playing. a lot. It wasn't, he wasn't playing a he lot. He wasn't traveling that much. Right. And it was mostly local, if yeah. I think. Yeah. And... Because um, I remember calling him one time. We played in Fort Worth, and I gave him a call. And I hadn't talked to him in a while. I hadn't seen him since he was with you. And he told me that he had won some kind of MTV thing. Liquid, I think it was called Liquid TV or something. Yeah, he and, he, some and he was all excited, and it, and it was like, you know, I told the guys, Rusty and Ronnie were playing in my band at the time, and and I told them, I said, yeah, this guy, this guy used to play bass with me. He said he's got a show now on MTV, and and I said he, it's called Beavis something, and they go Beavis and Butthead, and they like <laughs> knew everything about it. <laughs> And they were doing imitations of it already. So uh, he, yeah, it was yeah, a funny thing. Mike Judge has done really well for himself. I'm proud of him. He's great, man. He's, yeah, he's a I haven't rascal. seen him forever, but I saw him yeah. uh, about three months, two months ago. Three did you months really? Ago. I did for wow. a little, for a little bit. We what was that? Was that in Dallas or? I Austin? saw him at Sea Boys. He was watching. Oh, wow. uh, Jimmy Vaughn with the, okay. uh, and the little and the trio Mike Wow. Vaughan. So uh, I wanted to just talk a little bit about Golden State and just how we started that and because that was kind of interesting because I had been playing with Wes since like 2010 and I had mentioned to Wes that you know I thought it would be kind of fun if we could do 
some gigs with you. And then right after that, I started playing with little Charlie Beatty on guitar. And I think I mentioned to Wes, you know, would Anson have any interest in this? You know, just us getting together and playing. And I called you and I said something like, uh, well, what would you think about playing some gigs with little Charlie? He goes, and you said something like, well, I've known Charlie for 20 years, but I don't think we've said two words. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what's the truth. Right. And, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we'd, God, we'd played on lots of things mm -hmm. on the same shows together. Right, because you, you guys were both in the Miller there's network a, thing. There's a great picture. I need to find somebody that has it for... I'm rolling, I've got my Super Reverb, and I had my anvil cases, and I'm rolling mine this way, and I had on like a old wife beater t-shirt <laughs> with some slacks, and uh, and he's coming this way, rolling another one, right. and it's like we're we look, sort of looking at each other like two ships oh, passing that's great. the night. Yeah, that's funny. But, you know, man, Charlie... You know, after we started doing this, I, I mean, my God, we, it's like my best friend. Yeah, you guys became very good, we became very good friends. Best friends, man. I, well, I think he trusted you. I think that had a whole lot to do with it. We had so much fun. I mean, I, it's. Uh, and you're very, you're very understanding kind of of uh, what was going on with him. And that, that, I think that was. Somewhat, I guess. I mean. No, I, you were, you were very, I mean, it was sort of like the Sam thing, you know, that you. You just had a compassionate kind of view of 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 him the same way that you know you did of Sam and that that I don't you know Mark I don't know if it's that or it's just I'm I'm willing to let people be who they are yeah. and accept yeah. them for what well, they are I think that's what I'm saying and yeah. and um, you know I mean sometimes Sam did things that I kind of went scratch my head and went oh, wait why what. <laughs> Nine eleven. Why, 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 why would you do that? You know, and I mean, I, you know, I mean, I, of course, I'd do it myself and right. look at what I did and go, oh, "What was I thinking?" But, right. But you know, I'm not sure. You know, I mean, Charlie and I were total, probably bookends. Yeah, you guys were so different. Yeah. We're very different, bar none, I guess, far as someone loving the guitar, wanting to play the guitar, loving music, uh, you know, he's he's right there with yeah. anybody I've ever met. Yeah, yeah. Maybe more so. Yeah, just being totally into it. Totally into it. Yeah. Always wanting to be better. Right. Always wanting to grow musically advance. somehow. Yeah. In advance. Yeah, that's right. You know, yeah. Well, the interesting thing is, you know, you guys as a guitar combination, I think one of the reasons I thought of both of you was because you had both worked in bands with harmonica players. You backed a lot of harmonica, but at the same time, you guys had different enough styles, you know, you being very sparse, him being kind of more uh, complex, but at the same time, you know, he had the jazzy kind of edge. You had this really Texas blues, Chicago edge, and that that your styles were different enough that it would it would work as a combination. Yeah. And that's what I was looking at when I thought of the idea of you two guys working together. Well, I think it worked pretty good. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was. Uh, I think we got a pretty pretty good response. When mm -hmm. we, when, at least when we first started. Yeah, we, well, it was we fireworks, man. Yeah. It was fireworks, you know, to yeah. have you two guys on guitars. It was def definitely fireworks. I mean, you know, it was, it was something the guitar players just flipped over. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm not sure they got exactly what they thought they were going to get, but I think they enjoyed it once they were there because the combination really did sort of work. Yeah, yeah, it did. And, uh, and, and, and a lot of it was because of you. Well, you in know, the sense of that you were really willing to take a back seat where a lot of guys would kind of get competitive and, and knock heads. You tended to take a back seat to whatever he was doing. And and I mean Billy Flynn's the same way. I've seen Billy and Charlie together. It was it was the same way. Billy would just lay back and let Charlie do his thing. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, that's... God, that's the only really option. I think that's the only musical thing right. to do. Exactly. 
I'm, uh, music is never a competition for right. me. Yeah. Music is trying to find a spot to, yeah. work, to add something exactly to, or yeah. support. Right. And that's what I love about what you do is that you have a very rhythmic sense of what to play and a very, uh, you know, fill in the spaces kind of thing as opposed to the I'm going to take over. You don't you don't do that. That's not your 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 thing. It's hard to allow everybody to make music when you're a take over when you take right. everything over. Right. Exactly. I think better things can happen when you allow other ideas from someone else to appear. Right. Well, the other thing that was interesting was that both of you came from bands where you were the only guitar players. True. And the fact that you guys could come together and actually play together in a band. That was uh, that was kind of an unusual thing for both of you. I think that you were well. It was pretty I, much the first band you you guys were. That's probably true. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it was certainly the first band that Little Charlie rode in a van with other people in. Is that right? Is that <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I knew he didn't he didn't ride some a lot with the right. You know, yeah. in the Nightcat era, but I mean, there's always reasons to ride take your own car. Right. Really, sort of from the beginning, I, you know, we just sort of gelled somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the longer we were, the more we were able to be together and work together, it really, we became really good friends. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I miss him so much because he called yeah. me. Yeah. And... You know, it, well, I remember you told me a thing about him telling you, you know, if anything ever happens and you need a place to stay, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. you can I stay mean, with me, yeah. I mean, yeah. He, he was, uh, and that was not a normal thing for him to <laughs> no, offer, maybe not, but you know, <laughs> yeah, but he, he, he truly became my one of my best friends, and and uh, um, like I said, man, it, it'd be hard. You'd be hard pressed to find anybody that loved music the way he did. Mm -hmm. you yeah, know. he turned me on to a lot of stuff. Oh, jeez. In terms of jazz and stuff, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I couldn't learn anything from him. It was yeah, far more advanced than anything I understand. Right, right. You know, he's... Or Django, and, he was off on the Django oh, yeah. thing from the beginning. But it was interesting, too, because the Django thing, I remember, was very... He was very obsessed with it about the first two years of the band, and it kind of took a little more of a back seat. I remember later on, it seemed like, and then he kind of brought it back. Yeah, yeah. I think he always really dug that, and he just and he yeah. wanted to do it. Maybe he just we couldn't figure out how to make it. To, it didn't really fit in the band, I guess. Yeah, maybe yeah. how to fit it in, and then we, I, I think we finally figured out how to do that. Well, yeah, because eventually it became a thing where he would feature a piece that was, you know, minor swing or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and and it was him totally right just doing him. that, just and just him. Yeah, I know for a, yeah. for there there was neither moments. you or I really kind of uh, fit. In. I, I didn't know what to we do. We didn't really it. fit in that. No, no, I didn't fit in no. it. And I mean, the only thing I could do yeah. would be mess it up. So I mean, not right. you know, or make it sound totally not what it's supposed right. to sound like. So right. you know, I think once we did that, it it because we tried it in the beginning we tried doing some of those things with all of us and it just didn't really fly it really no. didn't it really didn't work no and uh, and i think it made him happy to do you know to right. be out there and do it by himself, himself and, yeah. and and do it yeah. because it was something that he really truly was amazing at yeah and yeah. and it was it was nice for him to have that Go guys. and i told him i, I yeah. said you know Charlie, you ought to sit down and play he goes, what do you mean sit down to play? I said, well, you know, it looks good when you sit down to play. Well, that's kind and, of the tradition. And for and for some reason or another, it seemed to to quieten his quieten his body down. Huh. And he always seemed to play better when he sat right. down. Right, right. I don't know why. No, I think you're right. Well, I think that's the tradition with that kind of music, actually. Usually when you see guys play that style, that Django stuff, it's not 
standing up? Well, after Charlie left in 2016, we ended up hiring uh, Mike Keller for a minute there. Sure did. And, uh, Great and he, player. Yeah, and he played with us for a couple of years. And, um, you know, Mike was someone I thought that you guys were um, simpatico musically. I, 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 I think it was, it was such a difference, though. Between well, what we it, were doing with Charlie and what we were doing with Mike. It wasn't new. Uh, it was still the name of, you know, the Golden State. Right. And, it, and I think musically it was it was very, very good. I think mm -hmm. it was uh, as good musically, probably, mm -hmm. as it was with Charlie. But... Somehow, maybe visually, it it wasn't, or 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 maybe it was just that now instead of the we were a a brand new band, right. something sort of new. Right now we were four or five years old. Right, and things can sputter. They can sputter <laughs> a little bit. I, it certainly didn't have. We're out here doing thing. it. We're out here doing it now, and it's kind of <laughs> like you know. I mean, I think. I, I have to say, I mean, I don't know about you, but there's a part of me that kind of likes to recreate and throw kind of new things in there to well, kind of spark it. Yeah. And I think, uh, like right now, we're out here with Rusty's in instead of uh, instead of uh, Mike, and we're we're out here with you know, I mean, because R.W. had a stroke yeah. and can't really play like he used to on the road. We're out here with Bob Welsh on bass, and uh, we're actually playing with R.W. next week, but that'll be the first time in, you know, two and a half years, yeah. Yeah. you know, that we're doing that. And uh, and frankly, you know, sometimes you have to find the spark that's going to make it really, Well, that's you know, uh, that's true. And exciting. I, it's uh, anything to do with Mike, because Mike no. was a was he, he's an a awesome great guitar player, player. and yeah. a wonderful singer. Yeah. That's right. And uh, I just think it would, and maybe we were tired. I think so, because we hit the road pretty heavy from 2012 on. We did. I mean, we were we were probably working 130 to 150 yeah. dates, and for a bunch of guys in their 60s, that's a stretch. That's a stretch. And then I was working with other people, too. Right. I was working with Eric right. when I wasn't working with you. Right. So I think old guys get tired. I think you're right. <laughs> but, you oh, know, guys can't afford to be tired. That's right. <laughs> but but you know, the the bottom line is that, you know, I mean, one thing I got to say, I mean, Charlie did not have to be out on the road. No. And the fact that he did it for as long as he did it uh was a sign of that he must have gotten something out of it to to do that because Charlie, both of you guys were kind of in semi-retirement at that point. Charlie loved to play music. Right. And he would play it whether there was people there or not. The other thing I want to mention is that R.W. and Wes were, for me, they were a really special combination. Well, they they, they because they've been friends. they've been yeah they were childhood friends. They've been playing together since high school, and that there was really a that was a to me it was a very special rhythm section to have those two guys it together. It was a great band. It, yeah, there's there's no yeah. doubt about it. Yeah, but, you know. Uh, the thing with Charlie, it was brand new. The thing with, with you know, and then with Wes and all of us, it seemed like, you know, like Charlie and I never played together. But, you know, he had played with Wes, I guess, or he'd play with R.W. Well, he played you, with R.W. You and, and Wes had played together. And so played. we were really kind of bringing everything into play. It's sort of like what we're doing right now. I mean, you know, Bob Welsh and Rusty have played together. Me and Rusty and Bob have all played together. You and Rusty have played together very little, but yeah. at the same time, you know, it all still works when everyone kind of knows everybody and uh, you have that combination of people that are familiar with each other. True. Sure. Yeah. So anyway, I, you know, I, the other thing I want to mention is that, uh, you know, I'm messing around with learning guitar and stuff and uh, and and listening to you back when you were making those records with Sam, and you were playing, 
the B.B. King thing with Sam singing was so friggin' spectacular. The way you play guitar behind Sam on that stuff, to me, you're one of the best representatives representatives of that style, of B.B. style of like 50s, 60s guitar, you know, you're just so amazing at it. Well, you, you know, I'll tell you what, Rusty Zen last night was pretty cut dang. Rusty's awesome. It, you Rusty's know. awesome. You know, he is. Rusty covers so many bases. He man. really does. He man. really does. He covers a ton of bases. And he does it to perfection. Yes, he does. I agree. Yeah, well, both of you guys are very sympathetic players. And I think that's. That's what I find really special about, you know, you, Rusty, Billy Flynn, uh, Bob on guitar for that matter, Bob Welsh on guitar. Oh, Bob. Uh, all you guys are very, very supportive when you play guitar. And for somebody that's singing and playing harmonica, it's everything to have people, guitar players in particular, that really know how to come up under what you're doing and, and support it and make it really fly. You know, you guys are able to do that. And you guys have this thing of, of this under this underpinning of what, the music that you guys, you know, do. And it's very, very special. I feel thrilled to work with guys like you. Well, you know, all of you. Mutual. Really. I, and I appreciate it. Yeah. I, I, you know, we've we've had a lot of fun here in the last. We have indeed, man. Since 2012. You gotta keep going. Last 10 years, yes. You gotta keep it going. So I'm looking forward to our next venture. 20. Yeah, 23. <laughs> I'm looking forward to 2023 when we do some stuff. So it's gonna uh, be fun, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But thanks again, Anson. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate, Appreciate it, it, man.